After the spectacle of the past couple of days, MPs arriving in the Senate in their pyjamas, hurling abuse at each other, playing video games during discussions and trying to pass off fart jokes as legitimate contributions to the debate, this week's poll question couldn't be more timely. This week, Lateline posed the question, does Federal Parliament properly represent the views of the Australian people? Here's a sample of what you had to say. Kevin Uren says it's time to dump the Westminster system altogether. He prefers a democratic approach more akin to corporate Australia. Can you imagine, he says, a company board dividing itself into opposing parties? And Michael Alexander Caddick is a fan of micro-party reps like Ricky Muir and Glenn Lazarus, as they are not career politicians. So now to our panel. Here in Sydney, writer and contributing editor with The Monthly, Richard Cook, Karen Skinner, National Director of Change.org, and joining us from Melbourne was James Patterson. At 28, he made history as the Liberal Party's youngest ever senator. They all joined me a little earlier. Thanks to you all for being here. Our late debate question is this, does the parliament properly represent the views of the Australian public? I'll start with you, Richard Cook. I think the short answer is no, but exactly why that's the case has changed over the years. And uh, we're in a position now with Senate reform where we can fine tune it, but it's never going to be perfect. Karen Skinner? No, I don't think it does. I think people feel um, disenfranchised and disempowered from what's happening in Canberra. I think there's lots of opportunities for politicians to be using technology to really engage people a lot more in the issues that they care about, but at the moment I wouldn't say that it is. James Patterson, you're the only parliamentarian on our panel. Is it safe to assume you're fairly comfortable with the status quo? Well, it's certainly a hard case to make this week that uh, it's all going swimmingly and no problems here. But actually, seriously, I do think that generally we're doing a good job. I think there are very serious issues um, around the Western world particularly. There is a real disenchantment with the political class and the political system. Uh, but I think when you sit back and look at the results that have been delivered by the system that we have, it's pretty hard to argue with. We're a really prosperous, we're a really harmonious, we're a really tolerant nation. And I think that's a really great thing. Are we any more disenfranchised today or is it just more visible given the changing media landscape, Richard? Um, I think that it depends how you measure it, but there are certainly ways in which we're more disenfranchised. I mean, if you look up the makeup of Parliament, Parliament 50 years ago, you know, it would have doctors in it and farmers and these kinds of people. And now MPs are drawn almost exclusively from either unions or um, political staffers. Um, uh, you know, there's a huge number of lawyers, for example, in Parliament that didn't used to be there. And so I think people look to Parliament and they see these kinds of people. They see people who are usually older than them, often whiter than them, often more male than them, and think that they don't really reflect who they are. Well, I think uh, Ricky Muir does represent someone that we want in Parliament, but I don't think we want him there by the process that got him there. Um, you know, the number of people who knew that they were voting for Ricky Muir and even knew who he was who ended up putting him in Parliament uh, would be very, very small. So um, it would be good to see an avenue open up which allows for people like that, but it has to be a more rep uh, representative one, I think. Karen Skinner, what's your view on the Senate reforms that were passed today? Well, I think the question is, um, you know, does it make people feel more engaged in Parliament? Um, and does it pe make people feel that they're, you know, more powerful? And I don't think at the end of the day it does. I'm not sure that the average person really cared that much about what was happening down there, actually. I don't know that they just want to be able to add a few more numbers um, every three years. I think they want to get more engaged. And I think when we saw the result... Um, in the Senate, I think there was some kind of outrage about how could someone get in with so few votes. But I think actually we've seen uh, people be really curious about the fact that there's the kind of average Australian down there. You know, there's someone who drives instead of flying business class, who said in his maiden speech that he didn't own a suit before, you know, he'd gone down there. We've seen, you know, people like Jackie Lambie talk about her son and his ice addiction. And it's, you know, it makes that debate really real. Um, and I think that's what actually people want to see more of from politicians, is, is, is real people telling real stories and really engaging. So I think it's right. It, it may not have been the right way to get there, but I think it really raises some questions and some challenges for the existing parties about how do you make sure that people feel connected with the representatives that are down there and feeling like those representatives are actually debating the issues that people care about. Senator, do they have a point to make in terms of the, the strict point of whether the people in the place you work actually represent the people who have voted them in? 
Well, the best test of whether the voters were happy with what they've had for the last few years will be the next election. Uh, and if you see people like Jackie Lambie and Ricky Muir and those like, sorts of people being re-elected, then I think you can say, yes, that is what the voters want. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion, though, that they won't be, and it will not just be because of the Senate reforms. I think even without the Senate reforms, it wouldn't have been likely that they would be re-elected. I think what you will see is uh, voters having more control over their own preferences. I think it's crazy that if you wanted to direct your own preferences, the only real way to do that in previous elections was to number up to 100 boxes below the line. That's crazy. Um, these reforms have made it easier for voters to have more control with their vote, and I think that's a, that's a very positive step. But do you take the point Richard made that once upon a time we did have a more diverse group in our parliament than we do today, where it is true that we have a lot of ex-unionists and political staff as lawyers? I, I take half of Richard's point. I think educationally and professionally, perhaps you could argue that the parliament is less representative, but in terms of gender um, and age and ethnicity, it's much more diverse than it ever has been. I mean, it is less male and it is less white and it is less old than it ever has been. So um, certainly if you look at parliaments uh, 50 or 100 years ago, um, they were as old and white and male as they could possibly be. So I, I'm not saying it's perfectly reflective today and there's, there's more to be done in that area, um, but I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. Karen, I think I need to bring you in here. I Should. certainly think there's a lot uh, further we could go in terms of um, diversity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at the number of women. Yes, there's a, you've been a big deal made of the number that are in Cabinet now, but there's it's one or four, a long one way to go. One in four or one in five members of Parliament are women. Yep, and I think we need to see more more down there, more in Canberra. But I also think we need to see um, politicians, the way that politicians engage with people changing. You know, no matter who we send down there, you know, what we've seen is that technology has reshaped the way we do business, the way we engage with our friends, the way we, you know, um, get information, and we want to see it reshape our democracy a lot more. And we're seeing it with politicians, but I think there's a lot more that the political system and politicians can be going to where people are, which is online. There are conversations happening, there are people engaged in issues you know, at change.org we've seen 3.5 million people engage on petitions, signing or starting, and they're on issues that they care deeply about, and we want to see more politicians leaning in and engaging on those issues, not just some of the technicalities of voting reform that we've seen this week. But Karen, how much influence does a petition like that have? I mean, it can have huge influence, and we're seeing politicians be shifted on that and politics be shifted. I mean, just recently we've seen medicinal cannabis be um, legalised as a result of a 250,000 strong petition started by Lucy, who's a mum whose son needed to use medicinal cannabis for um, the side effects of his cancer treatment. So we're seeing petitions like that that are just creating a massive groundswell, getting issues like that on the agenda that weren't otherwise going to be debated. But there are certainly petitions that aren't shifting because we want politicians to be leaning in into them more and engaging with them more. Richard, do you agree the online world offers an opportunity for people to become more engaged in the political process? Yeah, but I think it's a bit unclear at this stage exactly what that opportunity is. And I mean, medicinal cannabis, uh, that ball was already rolling partly because of Alan Jones. I mean, you can't get much more traditional media than that. It had already been sort of green lit, if you'll pardon the pun, in New South Wales. Um, so that was a result of Lucy's petition in New right, South Wales. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but the, the breakthrough moment was not the petition itself, but when that went on the Alan Jones show. And that was a result of a personal letter, I believe, rather than the petition itself. Oh, I, I mean, I think Lucy went on after she'd got you know, tens of thousands of people signing a petition and Alan Jones was certainly aware of that. And I think, you know, there is obviously, there's traditional media, there's the use of technology, they're going to go hand in hand. But I think, um, you know, you could see from that issue, from that petition, that it was something that people across Australia from really diverse backgrounds supported. James Patterson, you're the youngest ever Liberal Senator in the Parliament. Do you find yourself having to educate some of your old older colleagues about the merits of online voter engagement? Uh, no, I'm not being too presumptuous to come and lecture my older colleagues about social media. They're actually pretty sophisticated in their use of it already. I mean, politicians these days are more accessible than they ever have been. Uh, before I came on this show, I was replying to Facebook messages from constituents. I was reading tweets uh, of, of feedback, free character assessment of myself um, and my colleagues. Uh, I got hundreds of emails in the last few days about same-sex marriage and the uh, Safe Schools Coalition and all these issues. We, we are more accessible than we ever have been, and I think that's a good thing. We get more 
feedback than we ever previously would. Um, previously, you would have to come and visit us in the office or call us or write us a letter. Now, in seconds, you can, you can instantly give us your feedback. So I think we've got a better sense of what the community wants than we ever would have been previously able to be. What's the answer to engaging people more closely in the democratic process? We've talked about online petitions and, and that sort of engagement. What else is there, Richard? Well, I mean, there are some arguments that people don't have to know about policy that's very complex. I mean, um, if you look at how much value a vote has, an individual vote, and how that affects uh, the way that politicians act, it's quite insignificant. And so, you know, you can have very technical, very complex areas of policy, like health insurance, for example. It's unreasonable to expect everyday voters to have very deep understandings of something like that. They're voting for politicians that they think can exercise judgment on those kinds of issues. So um, I guess what we're really talking about here is the death of things like political parties and to a lesser extent unions, churches, community groups. And I'm not sure that there is an answer really yet. I mean, we're starting to see part of it from online, but it's not going to replace those institutions the way that they, that they used to exist. What about the idea of the plebiscite? We've got it for same-sex marriage, for instance. There has been a big debate about whether parliamentarians are representative enough to be able to go in there and debate it amongst themselves and make a decision. It doesn't require a referendum because the constitution doesn't need to be changed. Karen Skinner, are you in favour of the plebiscite? I think there's way much to cheaper ways this? to do it. I think that if you use technology right, you don't need to be spending millions and millions of dollars um, on, a, on a referendum like that. Um, and I think it's really disturbing when you've got politicians saying they're going to ignore it anyway. Like, you can't kind of have it both ways. Either you're sort of throwing it out there to the people and seeing what they think, or you're going to debate it yourself. But don't say you're going to spend millions of dollars and then say you're going to ignore it anyway. But I think that there's, um, you know, I, I think that there's cheaper ways to do it. Senator, what's your view on that? Because you can imagine a lot of the public looking at this would say, you're going to spend all this money holding a plebiscite, but then a number of you in government are saying, actually, you reserve the right to ignore the, f the result. Well, my expectation, Emma, is uh, if there is a plebiscite after the election, uh, then those members of the government will be bound by the outcome of the plebiscite. So what I mean by that is if you are a minister in the government and the government's position is to have a plebiscite, then you will vote according to the result of the plebiscite. Uh, in the Liberal Party, though, backbenchers have always had freedom of conscience. They've been able to cross the floor. And so I'd expect that a backbencher would be free to vote in favour or against, regardless of the outcome. But members of the government would probably be bound to vote in favour. OK, we are running out of time, so I'll probably just seek a last word from all of you on what you think is a reform that could be made or a way of looking at things differently that could, in fact, increase the, 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 uh, the Parliament's representation or effectiveness, if you like, in terms of representing the public. Karen Skin. I think that we need to see Canberra um, going out to where people are, which is online, is, is a large part of where they can go to and engaging more heavily there. And I also think we want to see more authenticity from our um, representatives in Canberra. We want to know who they are. We want to hear their story. Richard? Um, this is probably not going to be super popular, but I think that there possibly aren't enough politicians in Australia at federal level. If you look at the number of MPs that we have um, reflective of our population size, uh, it's quite small compared to the other Western democracies. You want more politicians? That's yeah. the answer. Well, I, I think that um, if we can sort of break the stranglehold over pre-selections, um, make the fighting perhaps a little bit less intense, then you might get a more diverse group of people involved. Yeah. Senator? On a similar line of thinking, I think uh, breaking down party discipline is a good thing. I think uh, other Western democracies like the United Kingdom and the United States, where the, the politicians are not as bound by their party's uh, view and position on things, I think is probably healthier. You see a better representation. Uh, you see it more often a, a person voting against their party and in favour of their district, uh, as they do in the United States. I think that would be a healthy thing. I think you'd see a broader spectrum of views being represented in, in public debate. James Patterson, Richard Cook, Karen Skinner, thank you all very much. Thanks so Thank much. you.